Hey everybody, I'm Dave Hecker and today we've got Dan Norris, uh, founder of WP Curve. WP Curve is a service that provides WordPress support uh, and maintenance uh, at a low monthly fee. Um, I've used the service myself and it was an excellent service. Uh, today Dan's going to tell us a little bit about their experience building a business based on outsourcing. Uh, so welcome Dan and thanks for being here. Do you want to give us a little bit of insight into how you started the business uh, and how you came to leverage outsourcing so heavily? Yeah, so um about 15 months ago, I was working on a software app with one developer in the Philippines and it really wasn't a very good business and I was sort of coming to the end of my runway with it, but I didn't want to get rid of the developer because he was, he was so good. He'd worked with me for about three years before that as well. And so I just emailed my list and asked them if they wanted WordPress help and it was, it was more or less what we do now, which is monthly support, unlimited small jobs for $69, but it was... I mean, the only difference really was that it was a different name and it was a different price. And it was, I don't, think, I don't even know if we had a, we had a site, but it was just a really basic theme I put up. Um, and I had 10 customers sign up in the first week and pretty much every week since. Almost, really? yeah, almost every week since. Yeah. So was it uh, uh, your plan to start a business like this or did you just kind of fall into it in hopes of keeping that developer? Well, no, I had to do something. So, I mean, this was the best idea I had. So, I mean, I didn't want to go back and get a job. Really, that was my only option, get a job or start this business. And that seemed like the best idea I could think of. And I was happy when people started signing up. Yeah, fair enough. Nobody wants to go back to a job. So um, how much outsourcing experience had you had? Have you done a lot of offshoring before you started this business? Yeah, I mean, um, so, so I suppose I suppose the, like the way I think about it really is building our own team. Like, like our guys, most of them are contractors, but they're still – most of them are full time for us. So I, I'd done outsourcing in terms of like, you know, Odesk and Elance type outsourcing. And I had had a couple of guys in the Philippines working for me, Andrew, who was my first guy. And I had a couple before that in my last agency. And I just sort of started getting those guys, you know, to, to do basic developer type stuff. But I still had a local staff as well. And once, once I got rid of that business, I really couldn't afford the local staff anymore. So I just sort of started doubling down on the remote staff. And um, for WP Curve, all of the assumptions we built into the pricing all assume that we're using offshore contractors. So there's really no option that we have to have to find our staff um, offshore. Yeah, uh, it's such a great price for the monthly service that, of course, you have to do it overseas. So, yeah. you know, we see clients... Uh, every day who are having trouble outsourcing overseas, this culture and time zone, it's pretty difficult. So why is it that you can do this and so many people can't? I mean, is there something that you've done that you feel like uh, really makes it work? Um, yeah, well, well, there's probably a few things we do. We we do some cultural type things in terms of like keeping the team happy. We do, we, we do a lot of getting our staff to refer other staff, which keeps gets sort of people who are the same have the same mindset and have the same expectations and that kind of thing. I've got a, a huge process that I use. I've put it up on my site. It's about 5,000 words that we go through how we hire developers, how we test them, um, how we kind of onboard them. All of that stuff is all we've done it so many times. I think we're up to 23 people now in 15 months. So, and, and that's only the people who are still with us. We've, we've tried probably for each staff member, we've tried maybe 10 that haven't. So we've probably trialed 200 odd people more, so we've kind of gotten those procedures really pretty pretty good and to the point where the team does most of it and then makes a recommendation at the end. Excellent. Yeah, so you've you've I mean to have your uh, uh your hiring procedure so well documented because I read that post and it was excellent. Um and then even then uh if you're accepting 1 in 10 it sounds like you're I mean starting off on the right foot by being very selective. Um what brought you to the Philippines as opposed to uh, uh India and all the other places? I had lots of bad experiences in India with my past company building apps and things. And I, that, that sort of at the time, that was the, the kind of the done thing to, to get developers in India. Um, and I just had lots of bad experiences. So that led me to looking elsewhere. And I started looking at a lot of content around outsourcing to the Philippines. I started looking at some, I think it was John Jonas was writing about it at the time. This is years ago. Um, and Chris Ducker, guys like that, Dan Andrews, they were sort of starting to write about hiring developers and virtual assistants in the Philippines. So I started reading a lot of their stuff. And James Shramko is another guy. He was, he was talking about this, you know, three or four or five 
years ago. And I just kind of followed, followed their advice and started with a VA and eventually started getting developers. And I went through, you know, quite a few bad staff members, but I also went through a lot of bad local staff members, like hiring people. I just kind of accepted was hard no matter where you hired them. And, um, I figured it was worth, you know, worth it to try and get it right. So eventually I found a couple of really good guys and they kind of led to finding lots more, lots more good guys. Yeah, there's good and bad people everywhere. We've yeah. certainly learned that. But, you know, looking at the Philippines, we've been watching that market for a long time. And a lot of our clients are looking for heavy software, um, you know, not just PHP, but enterprise software and .NET and Java, things like that. One of the things that we see is, um, you know, Chris Ducker has been very successful, but primarily with, with VA work, uh, yeah. sales, things like that, because uh, the language skills are good. P Filipinos speak English, but we've had a hard time finding really good tech over there. Yeah. Has that been your experience? Or? Uh, yeah, we've got, I've had a couple of guys who are really good. Um, but yeah, I think if you were, if you were going to hire like hardcore coders, you'd probably be looking more in Eastern Europe or somewhere. I think you probably got more chance, although you'd have to pay a lot more. But um, most of our guys, like for WordPress support, I'd say like 70% of our problems can be solved by someone who knows WordPress and who knows sort of basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript type type issues. Um, and a lot of the, the developers in the Philippines have, uh, you know, live and breathe this stuff. So they're really suitable. Finding the, the really senior guys who can solve absolutely every problem you throw at them is a lot harder. And we've been lucky to get a couple but um, we've tried to get more, and that's that's been a lot harder. So I think we'll, we'll probably, as as we need more of those type of guys, we'll probably go over to Europe and maybe even the US or South America, and um, you know, look, do some more complex tests around coding and system type stuff rather than just like simple WordPress tweaks. All right, and when you're ready to do that, let me know because I can turn you onto some sources. Uh, I'm ready for, now for really. Okay, well, we'll talk later. <clears throat> um, well, one of the things I'm, I'm getting is that uh, uh, one of the reasons that WP Curve is succeeding so well in outsourcing is that you have learned some pretty hard lessons in the past, like all of us have. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the offshore uh, nightmares and some of the, the India days? You know, we've all experienced that. Uh, how, how did you learn your, your hard lessons? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not really sure what the lessons are. I mean, the worst, the worst experience I've had is just a typical get on Odesk, get a quote for a, an app um and the, exp the experience i've had typically is the the price of the app doesn't change but the time to deliver and the quality of delivery changes so it's all well and good getting a fixed price for something but if you get to the point where you're just having to explain really really basic things that you wouldn't have to explain and it's taking three or four days to go back and forth and the time's completely blown out then i mean the price doesn't even matter anymore like with some of those apps i just got to the point where I, I, I just didn't even care about the price anymore. I just wanted the project to end so I could get someone decent to come and fix it. So um, I'm not sure about, I mean, I suppose the lessons learned with Odesk is this, there's probably a bunch of stuff. I mean, first of all, I wouldn't put up anything public on Odesk. I'd, I'd make sure I chase the developers that I want to apply. So I don't put up a public job and get spammed by 50,000 applicants because that's just a mess. Um, I'd start with a small job, make sure they do that, do a good job of that before they get a bigger one. Um, I generally try and find individuals rather than agencies if I could, although that's that, that's not a, a rule. But in my experience, I've had good experience with individuals. Um, but then again, I have used agencies for things like VAs, like Chris Ducker's service, and that's been quite good. But um, I think on Odesk, I've, I've had a few projects where you're dealing with a project manager and they're dealing with the developer and you can't deal direct and it just turns into a mess. Yeah. Um, so I like to deal direct with the developers. I'd like to go with someone who's got a good feedback score and and you know quite a few jobs, and not not look at the price too much. I mean, I would just much rather pay twice as much or three times as much for someone good than just get the cheapest because it's going to be a nightmare. And then I would also just keep it in the back of your mind that the the price is not the only factor that matters to a project. So you may get a fixed price on Odesk, but if it's going to take you five years to develop it. And, um, you know, you're going to be explaining basic things that you wouldn't have to explain to a decent developer, then you're paying for that in your time. And by the end, you'll be so frustrated, you won't even care about the price. Well, you, you started that answer by saying that you weren't sure what the lessons were. Um, <laughs> but wow, that was a list of, of really excellent lessons. Um, we right. talk about those things every day. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I, I'm hearing is what, what we tell people, which is um, 
You can't just put a spec up uh, and get uh, get a bid and turn the key and expect it to work out. Uh, software is it's a bitch. It, it just yeah. never works that way. <clears throat> yeah, you have to. I actually, I actually think um, I'm not very good at planning, and I don't think any software developer I've ever worked with is particularly good at planning, or any project manager is particularly good at planning. And I think it's all well and good to say this is what we're going to build and this is the fixed price, but in reality. Software projects for me very, very rarely work like that. And you're better off finding a developer who you can work hourly with, get to the point where you trust them and you can work hourly for a reasonable wage, reasonable for them. And then you can just work on something and build it the way you want to, um, which has a lot more risk to do it if you don't trust that person. But if you can get to that point where you trust the person, you just pay them a reasonable amount of money, then you can build something that's quality rather than just focusing on the price and trying to do a fixed a fix price and fixed term project. Absolutely. It's a great message. Um, uh, rather than just throwing something up and taking the first developer that comes along, uh, you got to dig in. You've got to work really hard to find the right people and support it. And uh, fixed bid is, I've seen it work well, but not very often. And when it does work well, uh, it's an expensive proposition for the client. So it's a yeah. very odd thing. Uh, we tell me a little bit about your, uh, your tools and your setup, um, uh, source code and um, how do you back all this stuff up and what, what's your kind of uh, tools infrastructure look like over there? Yeah, we don't have um, like developer tools as such because most of our guys are just sort of in people's websites working on <laughs> working on WordPress problems. We have a bunch of things. We've got our own system for managing client and client details that we've built ourselves. And the reason we've done that is because we've sort of set it up in a way where if there's an open job with a client, then those details will become available to that developer only when that job is open. So our developers can't go in and just access a whole, you know, all of our client data like you can with an agency or something like that. Um, so we've got that system. We've got a, a communication tool called Slack, which we use for kind of, kind of replaces email and live chat. Um, and we've got Google Docs for procedures, processes. Um, we use Jing just for quick little videos. So if I, if I do a Google Doc for a process, I'll you know, write out a process, use Jing for like a little screencast video, put that in there. Um, often use a tool called Skitch, which is a screenshot tool where you can mark it up with arrows and lines and stuff like that. Um, and then just drag it over into Slack to, to give people, to show people the screenshot of that. And um, which, which is PayPal to pay staff, so nothing fancy there. Uh, we use spreadsheets for managing like the hours of staff, things like that. Um, and we use Help Scout as a backend sort of support desk that our customers don't see. They just send emails, but we use Help Scout to manage the tickets. But we're also building um, a new version of that. And we've got a live chat tool. We're using Olark at the moment, but I'm hoping we move it, move over to Helloify, which is a software I'm working on. Mm. And that, that gives us the ability to do live chat with our customers, but also have our team available in there as well. So you've got your whole team in the, in the app. And if a customer comes on, the team can talk amongst themselves, f figure out a solution, and then one of them can get back to the customer and solve that problem straight away as opposed to kind of taking taking the message, putting it into the help system, and then waiting hours for it to go back and forth. So, right. yeah, that's about – I think that's about it. That's about five different tools we use. Yeah, but it's it's fairly lean, I think. I mean, that's a, a nice minimalist approach to tools, which I always love. Um, but it makes me think, is it going to scale well? Like, uh, what are your plans for the next uh, – two or three years. I know you're growing like crazy. Where, where do you expect to be soon? And can you support it with the current model? Yeah, I think we, we, um, we're going to hit some roadblocks. We already are hitting roadblocks with help scout because that the typical sort of support desk doesn't really work for our business that well, because our business is sort of not just support. It's sort of, it's almost like little mini projects. Yeah. So we kind of need something in between, uh, you know, a uh, help desk and a project management system. And that's something I think we're going to build ourselves. We're starting to work on something and it's going to, there's a lot of intricacies about how our business works that doesn't really get captured in project management systems. Um, at the moment, actually, I didn't mention Infusionsoft. We also use Infusionsoft for a lot of the automation and automating jobs and things like that and sequences for customers. And it's all getting quite complicated. So I think we're up to 550 customers right now. And we, we wanted to get to a thousand customers by June next year, which will be our second birthday. And by the time we get there, we'll need to have, I think, our own system that manages most of it, specifically the way we want it managed. 
And when you develop something custom for your own use, are you using your own developers uh, that are on the bench or how do you get that done? Yeah, well, that's something we're dealing with at the moment. So I think we, um, I think I'll, we'll probably hire a couple of senior developers who can be both the the role that Andrew plays now, which is like whenever anyone else can't solve a problem, he solves it. Right. We'll get a couple more of those guys probably um, maybe over in Europe somewhere so they can also be available for customer support for WP Curve, but then they can also work on the, the proactive projects. So at the moment, Andrew's working on me, uh, sorry, working with me on it, but it's, he doesn't really have the availability, so we're going to have to hire again. Okay. Um, and you mentioned Infusionsoft, which leads me to the last question, which really has nothing to do with outsourcing, but um, you know, we're learning all about content management, uh, content uh, marketing, sorry, at Sourcey. And wow, you are a content uh, machine. Um, I've seen you referred to as a, as a beast. Uh, you're certainly very <laughs> prolific. Uh, so my question to you is, um, I've been doing a lot of videos, interviews, uh, blogging. How do you create so much content? I think I saw you mention once you do 15 pieces a month. Now, I've, today I learned you've got two kids. How, how is it possible? What are you doing? How do you get so much content out the door? Well, I haven't really been hitting those goals lately. I did hit, I, I can I can work really quickly. So I, when I flew from the Gold Coast to Singapore recently, it was about six and a half hours of flight time and I managed to write 12,000 words for a new book I'm, I'm working on. Wow. Um, so I can type quickly and I can work quickly when, when I know what I'm kind of creating. Um, so that's one that's one thing. I've got lots and lots of ideas because we've got lots of inputs for ideas. Like we've got a Trello spreadsheet. People are sending us stuff all the time. We've got a really good audience that replies to my weekly email. I think I've got about 13,000 people on my weekly email and I, and I send that out and we get feedback every week and comments and stuff on social media. We've just got so many ideas coming in for content we can write. We also have a structure around like what types of posts we write. Um, I've just employed a content guy who starts next week who's going to be taking over a lot of that content for WP Curve. And he's got set kind of posts that he'll do each week, set podcasts he'll do. Um, we have guest writers as well. So so like the 15 a month is all of our content. So an interview like this would be counted. I do maybe three or four of these a week. Um, any Any guest writers that write on our site, that would be counted. So we have... One guy does one post a month, and then we just get emails all the time from other people who want to post on the site. So this, I mean, this, yeah, this, we we could do, we could do fifteen a month. That'd be, that'd be a good result. I think we could probably do a lot more if I didn't have any other work to do. Right. But um, yeah, I find well, it quite easy. It's, I mean, it's like anything. If it's something you enjoy and it's something you're reasonably good at, it's it's kind of easy. Well, we've learned a lot from your posts uh, related to content marketing. Do you think it's possible to outsource any piece of it? Um, I know the actual creation of the content, it's really difficult to outsource that. What about the, yeah. the Infusionsoft, operating the, the list um, and all these things? Are, are there, what pieces would you recommend trying to, trying to outsource? Well, there's a few things we've done there. One is we outsource the pr promotion of the content. So our, our virtual assistant, um, for lack of a better word, uh, Ness, who's, who's just sort of our gen general awesome person who does everything. Um, she does all the promotion, so we'll do it. We'll do our content. We'll write a one-page Google Doc, fill in a bunch of fields about where we want it posted, um, what you know, what image we want created for social media, what social media channels we put it on, what sites do we submit it to, all that kind of stuff, and that's all proceduralized. Is that even a word? Proceduralized. I like it. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. Um, so she does all of that. Um, I've also just employed Kyle, who's going to be actually taking over our content and even hosting our podcast. So that's going to be an interesting experiment to see if that kind of thing works. I haven't really seen that done too much elsewhere. Um, I've been trying to find a bunch of guest writers as well, and I haven't had a lot of success with that. That's been really difficult. So I I don't know what the answer is to that. I think, uh, actually, I had a good conversation with a guy who runs a, a, a multi-million dollar business based around... Uh, how do I describe it? It's, it? it's a business that really wouldn't exist without content, but it's not a content business. Sort of like ours. It's just, just creating a bunch of content on his side and that drives leads to his business. Um, and he employs journalists to do all the content. He employs them directly. They're Australians. He pays them a lot of money. Really? I think he's got five or six journalists. Um, and he tried everything he could to try and create good content and he couldn't get it done any other way. So I know that's an interesting option. 
definitely one we've considered as well is hiring people here and just training them up in how, how we go about creating content. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the guest posts typically don't do that well for us unless they're really specialized and that takes a lot of organization. Um, but yeah, we're still, we're still trying to figure out a and lot you, of that You've stuff. developed a really good ed editorial tone and a voice that you've made your own. It's going to be hard to replicate that, but, yeah. uh, <clears throat> I think it's that, but it's also like, I mean, there's so, some sort of content appeals in different ways. Like, um, like, like our audience is used to really highly actionable, practical stuff like lists, like this is what I should do. This is an example of what another company did. Here's a download to use it, to implement it in your business, that kind of stuff. Um, whereas there's other blogs out there that are just kind of interesting or they're entertaining or they're, I don't know, whatever. They're just kind of watch me as I, as I do this. So I think it depends a lot on your audience and what they're used to and what they like. And in our case, it's kind of hard for us to get someone to create that style of content. Um, whereas, I don't know, if you're starting from scratch, I think there's probably more ways you could do it. Or if you had a slightly different, less demanding audience. And also if you're in a space that was less demanding, like I've got a, a brewing business I'm working on and all the content I do for that, all I do is just like document what we do on the brew days. And, you know, this is, this is what we do. This is where we added the beer. This is like, this is something that happened unexpected. This is the labels we came up with. All of that, like really, really basic stuff. If I did that at WP Curve, that'd just be a flop. But in that business, that people absolutely love them. Yeah, um, and that'd be very so, popular here in, in Colorado where people are crazy for beer. Yeah, yeah. All so right. I think it, it depends a lot on your, like on the this level of sophistication of your market, I think as well. Like if you're in online marketing, you can't get away with anything like that. But if it's a market where they're really new to content marketing, you can you can just take the really basic approach of just documenting what you do and people that'll be a lot better than everyone else is doing it'll get a lot of attention very interesting let me ask you one last question um this question is kind of for me um <clears throat> since we're in the outsourcing business uh we try to solve uh this big problem that outsourcing is uh it's incredibly hard um you're somebody who's done pretty well at it i think one of the main reasons is that you you know that it's hard and you invest a huge amount of energy and time into making it work if there was one problem that you could think of uh, that you'd love to see solved by a service or a business related to outsourcing, what, what problem could we solve for you in the outsourcing world? Uh, hiring affordable developers in the US time zone. Really? <laughs> that's a pretty big problem. Um, yeah. So Yeah, that's something we haven't had any success with. We've got a couple of guys um, and this is something we're going to have to, we're really going to have to focus on now. It really, it's been it's been really hard and um if someone could solve that that would make me very happy <laughs> well uh the u.s time zone uh, ranges all the way down to uh, costa rica yep, argentina costa rica is where our, our current guy is okay yeah there's a lot of great opportunity in there and there uh so uh, we should talk soon about that definitely but in the meantime thank you very much for your time i really appreciate it congratulations on your success and uh, i talk to outsourcers all the time and Clearly, you've learned all the lessons, um, and you summed it up really well. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see all the success, and I wish you more. So we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you. Well, well done on creating the videos, too. I think this will be really useful for people. Great. Thank you very much. Bye, Dan. Thanks.